Hi, my name is Jason Jeffries, and I'm doing my presentation on ion mobility mass spectrometry. And in reality, I can do this presentation, it would last for 30 minutes, but I'm going to try and hurry through it and get it done under seven and still give you a general idea of what this machine is. Now, here's my presentation outline. Um, I'm going to give you a quick list of advantages and disadvantages, show you exactly how an ion mo mobility mass spectrometer actually works, and combine it with my paper and the data collected from that paper. Now, before I want to do this, I actually want to tell you quickly how and, how and why an ion mobility mass spectrometer is used. The basis of it is to get more data. What it does is it separates ions based on their size, geometry, and conformation, and then it separates them on their size to give you two degrees of separation and even more data to really show you what your molecule looks like. So like I said, you're going to get more data, and that is really great for all analytical purposes. Um, the machine itself will separate very accurately isomers, or isobars, and conformers, so you can discern the differences between molecules that seem almost exactly the same, especially like on a basic mass spectrometer. The combination of these two decreases chemical and external noise because they, most times scientists would have to transfer from one machine to another or just not in general. And that is going to give you like more data and less noise and interferences. However, there are some um, disadvantages. The field that this, is, this machine is used in is almost strictly physiological because the molecules are so large that it is almost impossible to just determine the actual size and realistic conformation without an IMMS. Those doing general organic chemistry don't need to use an IMMS because the structures are relatively understood, but those large protein complexes have very similar masses but act differently and therefore have you know different conformations and geometries and this machine is going to help you discern the difference between the two. And because the field is so selective, there is only one company that actually makes it right now and that's Waters Corporation and they make something called a Synapt. And it's the only one available and it's relatively expensive due to the fact that it's a combination of two machines. Now I want to get into how the ion mobility phase works. What it does is it has the ions that have been evaporated into this drift tube and go through what is a repelling grid and that gets rid of the, un the weights that don't exactly match up within your you know, somewhat known range and it, it is in a perfectly inert atmosphere and in that inert atmosphere the molecules are going to collide with the you know generally it's nitrogen they collide with the nitrogen atoms and the bigger conformation the larger ones that are more unfolded or whatever are going to pass through slower than say the smaller ones the more compact ones um, because there are more collisions with those larger um, conformed molecules and it, and, it, and it lasts for a while and they separate and then immediately after this are placed into a mass analyzer now I want to get on the the full structure I just went over the less con the less known the ion mobility part the ion the uh, <laughs> the molecules are ionized and generally used a electrospray ionization and then they are evaporated in a desolvation chamber those ions are then immediately combined with what is a traveling wave ion guide and what that does it provides a a way for the ions to travel through the machine and, and next it goes into a quadrupole and that quadrupole provides an oscillating electric field and gives a slight separation based on mass to charge ratio and in some ways stabilizes the ions on a correct path and I already went into the ion mobility part the trap repels unnecessary and unwanted um, molecular weights and sizes separation is where the actual collisions take take place and the transfer is where the inert gases are gotten rid of because they could interfere in the mass analyzer part the mass analyzer is somewhat different than what a normal mass spec looks like using the magnetic um, pulser this uses a pulser that pr that incorporates the exact same potential energy into every single ion regardless of their mass and they go through the exact same length of drift tube so the only difference is their mass and that detector is going to receive the different masses 
at different times based on their weight. And the lighter ones are going to come off sooner because they have more energy and more kinetic energy. And you can just use the kinetic energy equation. It's very simple math to determine the actual mass of each ion. The output transducer is going to take the signals received from the de detector, you know, through a photomultiplier tube and incorporate it into a mass spectrum and overlay it with the ion, ion mobility part. And I will show you an example of that in a little bit. Now, as far as my paper is concerned, they were dealing with a protein complex called DNA B helicase, which is responsible, it cooperates with DNA for its replication. Now, here is the, the monomer DNA B helicase. And what they would do is they use molecular modeling techniques combined with crystallographic methods to, in comparison with the ion mobility mass spec data, to determine what the actual structure looked like. And as you can see, this was 75% unknown. We all knew what the monomer and even the dimer looked like, but this, this hybrid oligomer actually ended up becoming a 20-former hybrid structure. Here is an example of the data. You can see on the right are two different sets of data based on the clamp heights. The left is an 8 volt and the, nine is a, and the right is a 9 volt. The top part is the ion mobility part where you can see the actual charge and peaks and those are the separate conformations of a beta 2 which is the dimer that they use for comparison. And you can see that the most common form was the beta 2 and on the right the most common form was a gamma 4. You can see the intensities in both the ion mobility phase and the mass spec phase. They are both done with respect to the mass to charge ratio. Um, here is a continuance of that data. The collision cross section which I mentioned earlier is determined in the ion mobility phase and based on the number of subunits in the structure you can generate a some like a trend line and you can also do this using crystallographic methods and the colored the orange, the purple, the red, the blue, and the light blue colors are the ones that they determine through crystallographic methods. But that black trend line was actually determined using an IMMS. And the fact that these two trend lines almost perfectly overlay on each other and they were done by two different techniques proves that this structure, this 20 former hybrid structure using the triangles, the triangle crystallographic shape is the actual true shape of what is the most common DNA B helicase. And that right there proves that the IMMS is a very great machine when you're trying to determine the, sh the geometry and architecture of very um, large complex molecules. And as I said, it's less common for smaller, lower weight compounds. But for physiological, where there are a lot of different compounds of similar weights and different geometries. It is a very, very useful technique. And I'd like to give you a look at my references. And thank you very much.